This is the Quantum Biology Podcast, where we break down the practical health applications of this emerging science, starting with healthy light habits and going wherever the quantum superhighway takes us. In this episode, we go deep on how and why it is crucial to optimize circadian rhythms during pregnancy and beyond with doula and certified quantum biologic practitioner, Nico Kennedy. Nico has a Bachelor of General Science with a focus on biology and psychology and brings an evidence-based approach to her work, which focuses on the connection between the light environment of the mother and the development of the fetus, as well as the mental and physical health of the mom. That's right, mom's screen time affects the baby in utero. We also talk about light and its role in labor, delivery, and postpartum. This is a fascinating, fact-filled conversation that's also incredibly important. Enjoy. Hello, Nico. I'm so happy to be talking to you today. I think this is such a fascinating topic. Um, Nico is a doula who has a specialization in circadian regulation and how it affects developing fetuses during pregnancy, labor, and postpartum. So we're going to get into all of those topics which are so fascinating. Um, But first, Nico, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. You have like a science background, married to a practitioner background. Tell us a little about it. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me, Meredith. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, So yes, my uh, background, I have always um, wanted to help babies into this world. That's always been my passion. Um, I think, you know, many women feel that way and feel the call. And for me, it's just always been a given that that was where I was headed. Um, So I got a biology degree thinking at first that I was going to become an OBGYN. And then um, along the way, realized that midwifery was more the route I was going. And so then I started kind of shifting towards RN type prerequisites and then realized um, that home birth was really where I wanted to be. And so then um, through all of that, like while going to school, I just, um, yeah, I, I really like just dove into like every aspect of birth Um, and then started having my own babies. Um, So that was where the science background was really from like a pre-med perspective that I then eventually abandoned realizing that wasn't exactly the angle I wanted to be in. Um, I went to school during the time where we started having a lot of like online classes and online work. And so, um, and I had my daughter before I graduated. So in order to stay home with her, I started taking online classes and getting an online job. And that was when I first experienced a lot of circadian dysregulation in my own life, which for me manifested in immune issues for other people, you know, can go all over the place about how that will um, affect them. So um, my husband discovered Dr. Jack Cruz's work and kind of started feeding some of that to me. My first circadian tech thing was putting a red filter on my screen while I was working. It was just amazing how it kind of <clears throat> broke me out of um, the kind of like addictive cycle that I had with all of that blue light being like a really high performing student and really high performing executive assistant uh, at that time. And so we were kind of doing the blue blocking at night just for general health benefits. And I didn't know that it was going to heal my seasonal allergies and other immune system problems I was having. But it did. So that was really cool. And I thought, you know, oh, well, this is great. And I didn't even really put it together then that that was what was going on. But that was the beginning of how I got into circadian rhythms, which was totally outside of my focus on like childbirth. Um, So then it's kind of a two part story where, you know, I discovered blue blocking at night and then realized I couldn't have the online job. Um, So I took a doula training because I really wanted to have more of my own experiences with motherhood before becoming a full birth worker. So I was doing prenatal and postpartum consultations. 
And um, when I had my third baby, that pregnancy, I suddenly found myself in a situation where I was outside of being able to control my environment because we had a wildfire that um, burned us out of our home while I was pregnant. So we were, it was really stressful time. And so I had to go into a different housing situation where I was able to like control my bedroom, but I wasn't able to control the rest of the like complex that we were at. So there was Mm -hmm. a lot of artificial light at night and stress right at that end. And then um, when that baby was born, she needed additional support. She was born at home, but several hours later, we transferred to the NICU for respiratory support. And so spending a week in the NICU is really what kicked me off with making the connection between circadian dysregulation and pregnancy and fit specifically. Like I didn't really realize they were connected before that. Hmm. So that was how this circadian piece got brought into my work and seeing everything that was happening in the NICU and all of these um, health workers having so much um, challenge with their health there and them not knowing anything about the light environment at night um you know watching the nurses coming in drinking their coffee in the middle of the night and seeing the difference between the day shift workers who are fairly normal and the night shift workers who were having thyroid obesity um you know women whose hair is falling out you know all kinds of things and the difference between the night crew and the day crew just really opened my mind to that my problems that I'd had were rather minor compared with what other people are going through. Yeah. And so I just started doing a ton of research once we got home um, and then back into our environment, back into blue blocking at night. And um, so it was kind of like a two part thing of like first discovering the circadian piece and then realizing that it applied to my work at the doula. Um, And so that was just, a couple of years ago that I've been diving in. So I found Quantum Biology Collective through Charlotte's work. Um, She was a little pioneer woman on Instagram, I think. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So I found her work um, and I had been thinking of creating a certification. And then when I found she said she was circadian certified. So I looked and found QBC and I was like, oh, great. I don't have to make it. Someone's done this already. (laughs) I really don't want to cover it for everything. I really just want to help mamas and babies. (laughs) Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So I was really happy to dive in and take your course. And it really filled in some pieces on the mitochondria health aspect that I Mm -hmm. hadn't really been clued into. And that was really great because grounding has just always been such an important piece of my own, like physical well-being. I've always needed to be like, you know, barefoot in nature. It was kind of like I grew up in the forest. You can see I'm still yeah. out in the forest <laughs> <laughs> so to learn the scientific pieces of that and so um maybe sometime in the future we could talk about oxidative stress specifically on pregnancy and that's another yes. huge piece kind of like on par with circadian rhythms but I think today yeah. we we're just going to talk a bit more about like circadian rhythms and um how important they are for pregnancy and um birth and postpartum yeah, absolutely. Cause there's, there are, yeah, there's so many pieces to this and the, the applied quantum biology certification is to look at the, the overarching framework, which is quantum biology. And then within that there's circadian rhythm, circadian medicine, which is a key, key piece, not the whole thing, but a key piece. So yeah, we'll see. We, maybe we could go all the way to oxidative stress. Um, let's just get going. And I did want to circle back for a second to when you mentioned about you know, just doing very normal things like online classes and having a remote job, right? Like those are very normal things that most people are, are engaged in one of those two things, I, I think. And yeah, it's shocking. And I'm just, it's just on my mind because I just rebooted my computer. We were having the audio issues, right? And so for a few seconds before it shut down, it turned off the software that I have installed that, pull, that softens the light. And I didn't even have my brightness up very high. It's the middle of the day here. The sun is shining. And oh my God, when it reverted back to factory settings for those five seconds, I was like, oh my God, I forgot how terrifyingly brutal the light coming out of a laptop is. So for anyone listening, 
Um, even if you haven't bought into any of this, if you just like, absolutely, if you're on a laptop, even during the day, make sure you install like Iris or I don't know, there's another one. I forget. Install some, what is it? Flux. That's right. Flux. Flux Flux or put on some daytime blue blockers. Flux is free. Perfect. Um, keep the, keep the brightness setting very low. I'm just doing this public service announcement because I, I had yeah. forgotten because <laughs> I just have it on all the time. I'd forgotten how, how like awful that light is. And you're right. It will, it's sort of, you know, training our brain to be addicted to it and causing all the side effects of, of any toxic addiction. Mm-hmm. So, so friends, especially if you're pregnant, please, please tend to your laptop. Um, all right. So when you started your work as a doula, let's just sort of start with some of the common challenges that you would see during, um, pregnancy, labor and postpartum, like just quickly sort of a rundown of the, of the sort of four or five things that you would see most often. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So in pregnancy, um, definitely like just the physical discomfort, um, swelling for the mom, of course, in pregnancy, you know, we can't necessarily see what's happening with the baby. There's a certain amount of testing that you can do, but a lot of, you know, it still is kind of a guess, like what will happen after the birth with the baby. Um, the mom has a lot of discomfort. Um, sleep troubles are really common. Um, appetite problems, digestive problems, skin problems, um, that kind of thing. Uh, increased like worry and anxiety, especially for first time moms um, or for moms who have had a challenging experience in the past. Um, and then coming into the postpartum, then of course the sleep disruption just gets even, you know, more obvious. And um, then that can also tie in with different mood disorders and then digestive issues still continue to be a pretty big issue for moms um, after the birth. So like kind of all of the main pregnancy complaints. Um, And then of course there are the more rare abnormal cases of after the baby's born, then do they have um, health challenges? Does the baby have health challenges? You know, are they the right size for their age? Did everything form properly? Um, You know, do they nurse well? Are they um, good sleepers or poor sleepers? Um, you know, there's just all kinds of things with the baby that you find out after, after the um, pregnancy is over. Right. Once the baby's born. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so before we, before we dive into circadian regulation and its importance in those areas, could you just give us your sort of brief overview of what circadian rhythm is and why it's so important to health in general? Yeah, absolutely. I think my favorite way to describe the circadian rhythm is that the circadian rhythm is the body's way of telling itself what to do when. And so it's really obvious. We all know that we can't be awake and asleep at the same time, at least not effectively. (laughs) But we don't necessarily realize that there are other processes that have, um, that can't be happening at the same time. And so it's like, obvious when you think of like a baseball game, like, the pitch has to happen at the right time. The batter has to swing at the right time. Like there's a thing or like an orchestra is another common way that people describe it where there's like the conductor. And then there are like the leads of each of the different sections. Um, So like the conductor is kind of like the central circadian rhythm. And then the leads of each of the sections is kind of like the peripheral circadian clocks. And they all have to communicate together to make a pretty sound. Um, And so if any of the pieces aren't like receiving the right signals, then they're doing things, you know, then the game can't go on or the symphony can't go on. And so same thing in our body. Um, If the timing isn't right, it doesn't matter if we have all of the right like pieces, right? We have a heart, we have a a stomach and, um, you know, everything presumably can release the right stuff, but we need it to happen at the right time and in a rhythm. So that's kind of, right. It's, it's that really makes perfect about. sense. Yeah. So, and that's why, you know, I've interviewed so many people who've had their lives changed by regulating their circadian rhythm. And most of them, 
were quite healthy, right? Like they were eating really well, they were very active. But what I hear you saying is like, you can have all those pieces in place, but if your circadian rhythm's off, your body's not going to be able to execute in sync the processes that are taking advantage of eating healthy food and having good fitness practices and things like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So the, so the circadian rhythm is really sort of what holds everything together in terms of Mm -hmm. our body's ability to do all the necessary functions with sleep, digest, mood, everything, like all of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So super cool. All right. So talk to me about what it looks like. Um, if, um, if a pregnant mom is, circadian dysregulated, meaning those, those natural cycles are not happening the way in coherence, the way they're meant to. Right. So when there's disruption in pregnancy, um, so this is where we just, you know, we just kind of have to start looking at the research that there is. So I'd like to start by just kind of sharing like how we know about this. Sure. If that makes sense. So um, I'm not just like making this up. (laughs) (laughs) Good. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So there's several different like branches of research that we have that feed into like our current understanding of circadian rhythms. And um, my favorite are the like observational and population kind of studies where we're looking at large groups of people and the Mm -hmm. data points that we have about them and then trying to figure out what's going on. Um, There's also like this newer branch of like genetic data that's um, coming into play. And that is coming from human DNA and also a lot of animal research DNA. And then there are straight up animal experimental studies. And so for people, we don't have a whole lot of like experimental studies, like the, you know, the, standard of like the double blind thing, um, mm-hmm. especially like already for people, but particularly with pregnancy, it's just super unethical to, yeah. <laughs> to design a study that would like prove or disprove circadian disruption being related to these things. So in my work, I mainly am referencing observational studies. So there are, of course, lots of people who say like correlation does not equal causation. Um, However, there's a lot of correlation between circadian disruption and outcomes. And particularly what I find fascinating is we find circadian disruption being a uniting factor between some of the most mysterious yet common um, pregnancy problems. And so, like, when we're looking at preeclampsia, um, Mm -hmm. restriction, like placental problems, uh, liver failure, a lot of these things that don't have a specific cause that we can see um, within the mainstream, right? They just remain kind of mysterious where there's like, we know that nutrition, good nutrition helps. We know that not smoking helps. We know that not having excessive caffeine helps. Like we know all of these things are all tied in, but we don't have like a central uniting factor that ties them all together. And so circadian disruption could fill in that gap and be that piece that's kind of missing. They're finding that with regard to mental illness, that every single mental illness from autism and ADHD all the way through end-of-life dementia, including, you know, in the middle of life, schizophrenia and bipolar, all of them have sleep disruption um, as a uniting factor. It's one of the symptoms of all of them. And so... Mm -hmm. Some scientists just a year or two out of the University of California pulled a bunch of data. Again, this is like looking at that like correlative like population data. Mm -hmm. And um, it was fascinating, but they tied it all the way back to circadian disruption experienced maternally, um, like while the fetus was in the womb before it was even born, mother's circadian rhythm, and then the rhythm set within the first part of life. Um, is a highly factor to every single form of mental illness. Wow. So just just to clarify, because I want to make sure I'm understanding this, this is really intense. So you're saying that adults 
who are experiencing um, all forms of mental illness from schizophrenia to Alzheimer's to dementia to autism, you, there was a strong correlation between those mental illnesses as adults and their mother's circadian rhythms when they were in utero. Exactly. Yes. Wow. And then I would imagine if the mother's was dysregulated, the baby is probably going to be on the mother's schedule for the early part of it, of his or her life. Right. So that so, dysregulation well, likely continued into birth postpartum? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So in, um, during pregnancy, the fetus is depending on its mother's signals as the interface between the environment and the inside of like what's happening inside of them. And, um, it's one of the things kind of interesting is I read an older study talking about the circadian rhythm of fetuses, right? But while they're still in the womb. So it needs the mother's signals to be in harmony because that's where it's getting its rhythm while it's inside the womb. And then when it's born, something that's really um, interesting is that they, um, at this point are born without showing signs of circadian rhythm. Really, you know, you think of the typical newborn that, you know, of course, they need to feed her on the clock. Um, and so their rhythms are very different than adult rhythms because of the unique nutritional needs where they're born kind of like premature compared with animals. Right. Um, they need to eat right. like every sort of three, four hours. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, um, so older studies talked about the circadian rhythm that babies had in the womb and newer studies say that circadian that babies don't have any circadian rhythm and I find that really interesting and I'm wondering if it's part of the way that they're measuring things then versus now Mm -hmm. or if circadian disruption has gotten to the point where babies are kind of being born with an um, like one author was suggesting that they're born with an obliterated circadian rhythm not a not a lack of circadian rhythm um, but one that's been destroyed because of artificial light at night being almost ubiquitous. Right. Um, so could you just quickly explain for, for anybody who's new to this, how it's possible that the light that a mom is looking at with her eyeballs is affecting a fetus inside her uterus? With, cause yeah, without an absolutely. understanding of quantum biology, that sounds like <laughs> what? How is that possible? I know. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Um, So there are like pretty much every system in the body is dependent on the circadian rhythm and the circadian rhythm has particular inputs that it uses to control the timing. And um, I usually use melatonin as the example that we look at the melatonin rhythm because melatonin, there is, so much research about the positive impacts of melatonin on pregnancy. And so melatonin um, is dependent on light environment. So we have melatonin that's secreted through our bo- throughout our body, kind of like around the clock, but then we have melatonin that's secreted from the pineal gland in the brain that is on a time, um, a time sensitive, like it's supposed to be running when it's dark and turned off while it's light. And so the light through the eyes is signaling the brain about when to do the nocturnal release of melatonin. And that is a process that is, um, (laughs) let me know if this is too complicated, but the melatonin that is released by the brain is um, kind of like through um, the blood, Mm -hmm. where like into like the, the chemicals have to build up to a certain level mm-hmm. before it starts to release. And so that level builds up over the course of a couple of hours. So it's like two to three hours of darkness. Then the levels of like the signaling hormone get to a high enough point that it says, okay, now let's do melatonin. Um, okay. And so, okay. I just want to yeah. clarify. So the body requires a certain length of time in darkness 
which um, has been explained to me as like, if you put your hand in front of your face, 12 inches away, you wouldn't be able to see it. Like, so it needs to be like at least that dark. So that level of darkness, you need two to three hours for the melatonin to build up in your system to get to the point where it would be released and do what it's supposed to do. Exactly. Okay. So, okay. So we don't do that. (laughs) When we don't do that. So um, let's, say that um, most of us um, turn off our lights right before we go to bed. Yeah. So that means once you lay down, it's two to three hours before your melatonin starts coming out. Right. Um, ideally, what we try to teach in circadian, you know, is to turn your lights down um, two to three hours before bed. Right. And that would follow kind of the traditional human, like, sunset and then you gather around the fire and then you go to sleep and so the way that I describe the amount of light um and what I've read in literature is no brighter than a single candle flame or the full moon okay um and so two to three hours before bed you want you don't want your house to be brighter than a single candle or brighter than a full moon so we're talking like well candles very low level mm-hmm. incandescent bulbs, low level red light bulbs, would you say? Or what, what are your yeah. thoughts? Yeah. And we could definitely get into that more um, maybe in a, like kind of the practical side. But yeah, okay. it, I mean, definitely the gold standard for me is the candle. Um, mm-hmm. And especially for learning, because the candle also does the thing that there's the light input through the eyes depends on what angle it's at. So like a red LED overhead will still stimulate cortisol, which is the opposite of melatonin. Cortisol is the daytime hormone. Melatonin is the nighttime hormone. Um, So a candle you naturally put down low where you can watch it and keep it safe. Mm -hmm. You don't put it up by the ceiling. And so you, we want it to be down low. And so I like to recommend any family that can to start with a beeswax candle just because that's like the best training for understanding. And there's something really magical about it. I think that humans have a strong relationship with fire. It may not be practical or affordable on an everyday basis. um, But especially for young families with children, like they will, they might fight when, if you just go straight to the red bulb, because it's like kind of creepy and weird. But if you turn on a candle and be like, Oh, it's candlelight. Then all the babies are like, Wow. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> wow. You know, like there's danger and you know, mm-hmm. like <laughs> a thing about that. I think it's a really good way, especially for families, to kind of broach the transition. Um right. so to get okay. back to what yes. happens if we just keep using our regular like white enriched LEDs and things. Mm-hmm. Um the pathway that turns melatonin off is through the nerves. So nerves travel really quickly. Right. And so as soon as a bright light hits the nerves, it can shut off that melatonin like immediately. Wow. So it takes two to three hours for the melatonin to start secreting, but it can be turned off immediately. And so when you think of like one of the first um, complaints of pregnancy, shall we say, mm-hmm. um, is increased need to go pee. And so yeah. like the first thing that happens is then more trips to the bathroom at night. And so if you don't shut your lights off until right and you go to bed, you lay down two to three hours later, you wake up and you need to go pee. You walk to the bathroom, flip the light on and then boom. Yeah. All like the melatonin. Then you go back to bed. All that melatonin that you've been building up so beautifully while you've been sleeping in the dark, you've stunted it by turning on the bathroom light. Right. Exactly. And so that's where it becomes like, a woman that may not have had as much disruption beforehand because like circadian disruption is highly correlated with infertility. Um, But a woman who's pregnant, like probably has a decent circadian rhythm. Um, However, one of the first things that happens in pregnancy is that you're likely to start experiencing more disruption if you haven't controlled for your light environment, because you're going to be shutting off the melatonin um, over and over again through the night, like right in the first trimester, less in the second, and then again in the third. Okay. Um, so melatonin is like 
super amazing for pregnancy. And that's where like we can take melatonin in the circadian direction and we can also take it in the oxidative stress direction. And so that's where it's a really uniting factor between these kind of two branches of quantum biology. Okay. So, ha- um, so having that release of melatonin is the foundation of having a regulated circadian rhythm. And it also is the foundation of not having too much oxidative stress in our bodies. Correct. Okay. So that answers the question of how the light bulb or the screen that a mother pregnant woman is in front of is affecting the fetus inside of Mm -hmm. her because all of those signals are that cascade of signals is started with the light and then travels down Mm -hmm. into her through her system, including to the fetus. Yes, exactly. And so um, melatonin is like, it's super important. It helps with implantation. Um, Okay. It helps with the fetus, the um, placenta and the placenta developing. And then, like I said, it has that antioxidant effect that reduces the, that balances the oxidative stress. Okay. So let, let's go. So we've gone, we have gone a little bit into the circadian rhythm. Let's go into the oxidative stress route for a minute. So okay. when we, we um, s- stunt the release or suppress the release of the melatonin with artificial light, either from a bright light bulb, a phone, a television, whatever it may be, unless we're wearing mm-hmm. high quality blue blocking glasses. So we've turned those things on. It stunts the melatonin. And so tell us about the effects of that in terms of oxidative stress. Okay. So that just, um, melatonin is a major antioxidant and it is more powerful than any of the dietary antioxidants and our bodies make it. So it's really, um, like a fundamental part of our antioxidant system. And so oxidative stress naturally increases in pregnancy and, so oxidation, it's like a tricky thing. And that's where I like, you know, anyone who's really interested in this should definitely come in and take the quantum biology course because it does such a good job of describing um, how our body uses oxidant and antioxidant forces. And so we need some level of oxidation in order, like that also facilitates implantation and different things to the placenta. But it can go out of control. And if it goes out of control, then it starts damaging, not only like invading pathogens, but also starts invading our own bodies. So the melatonin is just a really like natural way to make sure that oxidation can happen in the places in our body where we want it to happen, like within the immune system or in certain phases of the like embryonic development. Um, without it going out of control and actually like harming things and making like, um, like inflammation is really highly is like oxidative stress in the immune system. Right. And so that puffiness is a Mm -hmm. really common complaint of pregnancy. Yeah. Um, So having uh, quality sleep and quality melatonin um, is what can balance that. And there are other things too. Um, of course, like all the things described in the course and, um, and they're important like during pregnancy and then also postpartum for healing as well. So it, all of this is kind of like a lifestyle journey. And then as we were talking about how it affects the baby, when the baby is born, that is an event that naturally has a high increase in oxidative stress because the baby is going from having all of its oxygen from the umbilical cord to breathing actual air. Mm. And so like oxygen is the main, um, like ox, right. That's the main thing of like the whole antioxidant versus oxidative stress thing. And so when the baby starts breathing oxygen, that is naturally a high oxidative stress event. And so, um, babies don't secrete any of their own melatonin, not in significant amounts so we can measure their natural way is to get it all through the breast milk. So the breast milk is making the melatonin that the baby needs to transition um, into being an air breathing being. Um, And so that's where it's really important for the mother to have a strong circadian rhythm 
through labor and delivery and postpartum so that the baby has that protective melatonin um, to counter the natural oxidative stress that it experiences at that time. Wow. Nature yeah. is so cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the mother, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, a, so a mother who is living in, with, in a circadian regulated state is making enough melatonin that her breast milk is filled with it and she's passing it on to the child. Yeah. In a time dependent way, because it, her breast milk will alternate between cortisol in the day and melatonin at night. And so for mothers that pump, when they, they label their milk when it is, but it's, they also need to deliver the nighttime milk to the babies at night right. and the daytime milk in the day. Cause if they give that daytime milk, then they're giving their baby a shot of cortisol in the night. And then that leads to a fussier baby who doesn't want to sleep because it just received hormones that are out of sync um, with the time. Right. It's like giving your baby a cup of coffee or something. Exactly. The cortisol breast milk versus the melatonin breast milk. This is so fascinating. So if so, when we're, when a mom is pumping, you want to label the time of day that you, that that yeah, milk was pumped. At the time of day and so you can day. deliver it at a, a, a commensurate time of day. Okay. Yeah. And then it's also tricky because the breast milk melatonin spike is usually around 3 a.m. And so a lot of moms will maybe want to skip their middle of the night pumpings because it's inconvenient. Yeah. But that's actually the time to harvest the most melatonin. Interesting. Okay, mm-hmm. so so the 3 a.m. feed or the 3 a.m. pump is the, the milk with the most melatonin in it. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Another then thing if you really yeah, fast, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> is that um, babies who are premature um, tend to have higher oxidative stress, and mother's milk of premature babies actually tends to have higher levels of melatonin in it than um, babies who are full term. Wow. So the mother's body is compensating Mm -hmm. knowing that, that, that the premature baby is going to need extra doses because they didn't stay in as long. Yeah. So cool. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay. So let's, let's move through um, into delivery. So talk about circadian regulation and how being circadian regulated can help in the labor and delivery process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is really cool. So um, labor onset tends to happen at night or in the early morning. Mm -hmm. Um, And so some of the folks who are looking into this are saying that that's happening less and less and breaking down um, because of circadian disruption. Hmm. But that there's a very good reason for that to happen. Like historically they say, oh, maybe it was for because of like reduced predation or like mom doesn't have as much work to do. The older kids are sleeping in the home birth context. Like there's a lot right. of reasons for labor to happen at night, even though it's inconvenient for people who make a career out of it, like OBGYNs, <laughs> right? They would rather it happen in the daytime, I'm sure. Um, but the natural process is for it to happen at night. And that is, Um, largely driven by melatonin. And so mothers that have high circulating melatonin, melatonin is synergistic with oxytocin and oxytocin is what's driving the contractions. Um, Mm. So melatonin and oxytocin work together. So with high melatonin, oxytocin is more effective. Contractions are stronger. But amazingly, the melatonin is also a pain reducer. (laughs) And so Women that have high melatonin have stronger contractions, but they feel less painful. Wow. So really cool synergy there where they work together. And for women that are having labor inductions, there's a lot of research now that if they have to have synthetic oxytocin Mm -hmm. to also give them synthetic melatonin at the same time um, to make that more effective, they can have a lower dose of the synthetic oxytocin and Um, not experience that like painful, like out of control feeling that so many women go through during an induction and then scheduling that induction at night. um, Also to like capitalize on whatever endogenous melatonin mom does have. Right. 
So, okay. So um, if you do need to have an induction, it would seem that you would want to be in a dark room for a really long time and then have the induction, like maybe around like three o'clock in the morning or something. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which again is not the most convenient thing for people who right. make a career at birth work. Um, and then, so that's where, um, like I have some really great photos that I found of, um, like circadian labor and delivery suites where the lighting like changes, right? So they want it to wow. be bright enough that staff can see to do their job, mm -hmm. but that the moms can still have their melatonin. And then this is really wow. important too for bed rest, like the most high risk moms and yeah. end up on bed rest. And then that's like a sure recipe for circadian dysregulation unless they're in the um, having a circadian lighting at the same time. So there's some really great, um, I think they call it biodynamic lighting yeah. in the institutional context. So there's that's some really so good cool. Who's, who is thinking so much about this that they've created circadian optimized birthing rooms? Where is this happening? <laughs> it's, 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 it's all together, any kind of inpatient setting. Um, but they found like a woman's having contractions. And so if you think about like then going to the hospital, that really bright light, you shine a green light in a mother's eyes, her contractions will slow down or even stop. Wow. But it does make a big difference, the right. light environment. And there are there hospitals or birthing centers that are doing this? Or is this just theoretical? This would sort of be like the ideal thing to do. Okay. It's theoretical as far as I know, but there are some right. that are um, implementing this. And part of the challenge is that, um, most of like the LED technology has been driven by like cost effectiveness and reduced mm -hmm. electricity. Um, and then when you look at circadian lighting, you have less lighting at night, but you need so much more lighting in the day that the energy ends up costing more. And so right. they get a lot of pushback in the sales pitch of this. So like, it's so much better for patients. It's so much better for staff too. Like um, yeah. people that work, long term in night shift, there's a certain mm -hmm. proportion actually do really well. Um, a lot of the research that we have about circadian dysregulation comes from night shift workers and all mm -hmm. of the health challenges they tend to have. Yeah. And part of that is that some people are able to keep their melatonin circulating at night even though they're awake and working. So these wow. biodynamic how are they is that because of the the lighting environment that they're in isn't quite as harsh or they work in a place where the lights are dimmer or do we, um, could we know why we, that is we don't specifically know but there was okay. a really interesting paper that showed that there's like 50 fold um variation between individuals and in how much their melatonin will be suppressed by the light environment that they're in so some people really can handle more light at night than others. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. That reminds me of like the experiments that, um, uh, what was, what's the book, the rainbow book anywhere he, where he talked about how they use when electricity was first discovered, they would do like those circles and someone would touch the, the bulb with the electricity and then everyone would hold hands and feel it go around. And like one out of every 20 people would just faint and have like this totally adverse reaction. And nobody could figure out why it didn't seem to be correlated to height or age or weight or fitness level or any health level, anything that would just be. So I'm just, yeah. It reminds me of that, that there's certain people who are just more robust in their mm -hmm. ability to handle the, to handle light than others. So and yeah. the way to know for yourself is like, how are you doing? <laughs> how are you yeah. sleeping? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Are you having other health challenges? Because like, like I said, when I was in the NICU with my daughter, um, you know, one of the nurses had been doing it for decades and her sister had been doing it for decades too. They were both mm -hmm. um, NICU nurses um, in different hospitals in different states. Um, but like their family seemed to be robust, but you know, this woman had all these health challenges and she just, you know, was joking about being the neighborhood vampire and, um, <laughs> you know, she didn't want to like see or hear that her job was the reason she was having those particular health challenges that are, right. you know, really common among people who do night shifts. Yeah. 
Yes. We just had a woman on a call recently who switched from a night shift to a day shift and she immediately lost 20 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. She was like I did nothing except change my, my time, <laughs> my work timing. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. So one of the um, things we haven't touched on yet that also comes up a lot in pregnancy is that um, mistimed eating is like the second most powerful dysregulator after mistimed lighting. Right. So food um, is also a circadian input in addition to light. Okay. So t- what does mistimed yeah. eating look like? Tell us about that. Yeah. So mistimed eating um, is when you don't give your body enough time to go through autophagy. Like at night, the digestive system has other jobs besides food. And um, so in pregnancy, we have this increased nutritional need um, that's highly recognized and everyone, everyone knows that everyone knows you need to eat more in pregnancy, you need to eat better. Um, and so it's really common for pregnant women to like wake up in the middle of the night and be hungry because they haven't eaten enough during the day. And so that is another way that women will get dysregulated as if they, um, like from the research I found, it's specifically carbohydrates um, in darkness that don't mm. digest well. Cause okay. these, um, yeah, they cause, yeah, like insulin problems, basically. And so this also comes from night shift workers, where they found that night shift workers, this is experimental, kind of newer um, things that they're trying, but weight problems are so common in night shift workers because they tend to eat at night, but they also tend to eat in the day. So most night shift workers are actually eating around the clock. Um, and so, they so their digestive tested, systems they, never get a break. Yeah. So they tested like, what if they eat only during the night with their work or what if they eat only during the day, even though mm-hmm. they're working at night and found that the night shift workers working at night who ate during the day had more aligned circadian rhythms than night shift workers who ate with their shift. And then it specifically was the insulin carbohydrate pathway. Um, it was most negatively effective. And so in pregnancy, there's like, women are so smart. <laughs> and so we've actually like a lot of people figured this out. And so I don't know if you've seen, like there's a condition in pregnancy that um, where a woman will experience a lot of nausea and vomiting that won't go away after the first trimester. It will just keep going and going. Mm-hmm. And so for this, women have found the bacon cure. And so that's keeping a few strips of bacon by the bedside waking up in the middle of the night, eating that bacon and going back to sleep. And so like tons of women have said, like, I cured my, um, you know, my vomiting in pregnancy by eating bacon at night. And so there you have the salt, the fat, the protein and no carbohydrates. Wow. This is so, so interesting to me because I had nausea like that in my third pregnancy and oh. um, I did not have it in my first two. I just had the normal low level first trimester. And the third one, I was just ragingly sick all the time. And I had, I was also in the beginning stages of chronic fatigue from having a dysregulated circadian rhythm. Cause in that between the second and third child, we had moved. Um, and we were living in a city, we were living in a high rise on like the 28th floor in a tropical wow. environment. So our windows were closed all the time because you had the aircon on nine months a year. Uh, mm-hmm. And like, I didn't know anything about light bulbs or screens or anything. So it's in hindsight, I'm looking back um, and all this is lining up because yeah, I had nausea, like I had not just nausea, like forceful vomiting. Yeah. Many, many hours every day for months and months and months. <laughs> Yeah, it's so terrible. It was <laughs> awful. <laughs> we used so, to joke because when it first started happening, yeah, when it first started happening, my husband was like, oh my God, honey, are you okay? What? And then by by the end, he's like, put his magazine down, be like, sounds really bad. And I go back to reading. <laughs> he's like, it was just yeah too constant to care so it's become a bit of a joke but that's so interesting because yeah I absolutely my circadian rhythms were totally messed up compared to what they had been Mm -hmm. yeah wow all right yeah so I've seen that baking cure going around and no mention of like the circadian timing of food and like that you should be careful with carbohydrates after dark um I do get a lot of pushback from people online when I talk about this because there's like a 
you know, like pregnant women should never fast. Autophagy isn't exactly fasting, but I found that I can't really use the like intermittent fasting has such a wide range of things. Right. Yes. Uh, doing it. But autophagy is extremely important in pregnancy. Right. Um, and autophagy obviously. requires a window of time where you're not eating that hence the food yeah. being a circadian signal. Okay. So exactly. what would be sort of, if you, let's say you're not having, um, insane vomiting situation, you're just having a relatively normal pregnancy. What would be a good window for, for eating dinner and then eating breakfast? Mm-hmm. Um, so it doesn't depend necessarily on time. Like mm-hmm. it's not clock. It's the light environment. And so right. it will be totally different for a woman living at the equator compared with a woman who is living, you know, in Alaska or Scandinavia. Um, so um, I really like Lily Nichols' work. She's a dietitian who's really focused in on pregnancy and postpartum. And she found that traditionally, like in the tropics, carbohydrate intake could be up to 30%. But in the, you know, in the poles, it could be as low as 1% depending on time of year. Wow. Including for pregnant women. Wow. And she says, according, I haven't looked into this myself, but she says that carbohydrate minimum recommendations have no scientific foundation and that there is no research that actually backs up the claim that ketosis is dangerous for women during pregnancy. But that's the mainstream stance is that pregnant women should never fast and pregnant women should never be in ketosis. Um, Okay. But from research and from what I've studied with the circadian rhythm, it really depends on where you live. So if you're pregnant, in, a, in the far north or very far south, um, and your daylight hours are really short, like you have a five-hour daylight, then you're going to be eating after dark, and then that means that your carbohydrate metabolism is going to be dysfunctional. Um, and so uh, Jack Cruz has a lot to say about this, too, um, and the importance of eating a high-fat, high-protein diet in those kinds of climates. Okay. Um, and, that, and so the circadian rhythm of digestion is playing into that. And so that's kind of like, you know, we're getting out there into the, um, you know, because then likewise, like in those polar climates where we have like, conversely, you're pregnant in the summer and you have, you know, 19 hours of daylight. How are you getting the eight to 10 hours of melatonin at night? You don't have that much night to mm-hmm. work with. And so traditionally, um, people that lived in those climates would usually do half their sleep at night and half their sleep in the middle of the day um, and have a polyphasic schedule, um, which likewise nowadays they always say like pregnant women need, you know, eight hours of sleep. And so like historically that wasn't the case, but now we have this 16 hours of lighting. And so a lot of the knowledge that we think to be true about pregnancy is based on people who have been living in an environment where we always have 16 hours of daylight, whether that's artificial or whatever. Um, Right. And so that light environment through the melatonin cycle and all the other things, the circadian rhythm controls really changes things. And so we don't actually have good data for what um, someone who was only experiencing the natural light environment. Um, But I found this case study that's really cool that I'd love to share that's about the newborn period. Okay. And so they got this um, newborn in this family and they exposed the baby to no artificial light whatsoever. It was only natural light. And so right now they say that it takes um, well over a month for a baby to start showing any kinds of its own like circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. This baby that had no artificial light started showing signs at one week of age. Wow. Wow. And what does that so, look like for a baby to show signs of circadian rhythm, like like a, a normalized sleep and wake schedule and a normalized eating schedule? Yeah, basically for them to be awake more in the day than the night. Um, okay. But specifically, they were, mel- they were I think they were measuring the um, melatonin in saliva. Okay. They were measuring the, the baby's mm-hmm. melatonin. And they noticed that yeah. a baby at one week was able to start producing its own melatonin compared to a baby. Some kind of biological marker. I'm trying, I don't remember specifically that one. I'll have 
Okay. I'll, I'll they were, this, was, this sounds pretty rigorous. Okay. So they were testing the baby's saliva for signs of circadian regulation, and they found it at one week in a baby who was only seeing sunlight, moonlight, and candles. Yes. Yeah. Wow. All right. So it can make a huge impact on the family sleep. Um, another really interesting thing that I found as far as the postpartum period is that moms who wake up more in the night tend to have lower levels of postpartum depression than moms who have longer sleeping blocks. And really? so there's some things we don't really understand. The author suggested that perhaps moms who have postpartum depression are less able to wake up and take care of their infants. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one of those right. like causation, yeah. causation, which is the chicken and which is the egg here. Yeah. Um, but I love the, um, the possibility and the experience from my own pregnancies that, um, the postpartum period doesn't have to be this terrible, like sleep deprived zombie kind of thing. I think a lot of that has to do with using improper lighting mm-hmm. at night and then you use the really dim, nice, cozy lights that you can wake up, take care of your baby, not disrupt your melatonin and go back to sleep uh, much more easily than a mom who's using any kind of LED or fluorescent lighting in that environment. Right. So yeah, that's a really good point is when we wake up for those nighttime feedings, keep the lights really dim mm-hmm. or I would just, I was such, I hate waking up. I just keep them in bed <laughs> so I yeah. don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so the babies, um, yeah, may also have their circadian rhythms get set more quickly too. And uh, but for a baby, it's really um because they don't start producing melatonin right away, mm-hmm. the sunshine, piece, which we haven't talked about at all, but there's so much good research about sunshine too, that we could talk about. Yes. <laughs> like okay. So let's jump there the- right now. I'm kind of, I, I could keep you here all day. There's so much interesting stuff to talk about. Okay. Yeah. So let's start, let's jump. We've really, I think we well covered nighttime darkness, melatonin, circadian signals. So yeah. what are, so we want to be taking our, ourselves, as the mom and the dad, everybody really wants to be outside during the day. Mm-hmm. But what is specifically happening with your ba- with a baby then? Getting yeah, that, getting that so, natural light. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, baby after it's born, we kind of go in reverse order. So, baby after it's born um, doesn't really produce melatonin. So, but it does respond to light stimulation. Okay. So, you want to bring your baby outside. And and there's so many good reasons to do this, but one of them is so that it's more awake. So you have a noisier, brighter daytime environment to compare with the dark, quiet nighttime environment. And that is um, more effective. Like limiting night for adults is so important because that's our main source of disruption. But for a baby, they don't have their melatonin thing really happening uh, via light, but they do have their wakefulness happening via light. So taking the baby outside will make it more awake in the day. So then it's more tired to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. And so they've, what they found is that um, having a brighter day is more effective for a newborn than having a brighter night and a dimmer night. (laughs) Does that make sense? I see. Yes. So you can have the darkest night possible for a baby, but it's not going to necessarily help regulate their sleep patterns as much as being outside with the baby in the natural sunlight, just like going for walks, being in the shade, right? Like you don't need to be like in the direct bright noonday sun. Like we're just talking about like being outside in some capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, So then we could move backwards. So that's when the baby's born. So then we could talk about um, in labor, we could talk about how that bright light will slow down contractions. Um, Mm -hmm. Bright light is also related to serotonin. And so they think that serotonin is largely responsible for the kind of like psychedelic and transformative experiences that women go through in labor. Mm -hmm. Um, Serotonin is also the precursor to melatonin. So in order to make melatonin, we have to eat a lot of tryptophan. It has to get transformed into serotonin and then it becomes melatonin. Okay. Yeah. So the bright daytime, like for women that do labor through the day, 
that can facilitate the hormonal response to give them kind of like this emotional Mm -hmm. um, thing that happens during labor and also build up all of that serotonin so that when the nighttime comes, they have all of the like building blocks to um, turn into melatonin. Okay. And I feel, I feel like I have a case study for everything you're talking about because when my first baby, uh, I went into labor, it was progressing. We went to the hospital. It stopped like for like 12 hours. <laughs> like, and of yeah. course, like it was bright and it was a foreign environment. And I, you could, you know, you go into flight or flight probably. And there's all kinds of things happening. Um, my middle baby, I was able to organize a home birth. Um, and yeah, the labor start to finish was nine hours. And I definitely noticed because I wasn't obviously on any kind of IV for the, in that situation. Um, so yeah, like during the contractions, obviously there's no thought happening. It's just <laughs> the experience <laughs> itself. But in between yeah. the contractions, there was a period where I was like, I am not sober, right? Like <laughs> the, <laughs> there was I, the, the biochemistry, whatever was going on in me, like just what you were saying, there was some, something being produced that mm-hmm. like, I was not in, wasn't like contraction stop. Okay. Here I am. Like I was in an altered state for sure. Um, which mm-hmm. I didn't notice when I had all the, you know, the other stuff going in through the IVs, but in that, in the natural birth, I definitely mm-hmm. noticed it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's one of the things with home birth is that you can actually like go outside. And that was what was so devastating when I had to go into the NICU with Mm. my third, I had a home birth for my first. Um, And then same thing, my second, I did, I had a, I I love what you said that you were able to organize a home birth because that's really what it is. Like there's so much that's on you as the family in order to facilitate the, the birth happening at home. Um, but there's so many benefits yeah. from the circadian perspective, um, like being able to go outside during your labor, being able to feel safe, um, you know, set up your own environment. It's, um, yeah, it's really important. And I definitely noticed that too. My two home births that I had were um, 12 and 14 hours. The one where I went to the hospital took 49 hours. <laughs> wow. Yes. <laughs> It's so hard to relax wow. into yes. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. Um, about it. And so part of that is the oxidative stress too, that being um mm. out in the sunshine like gives you electrons, especially if you can like wear grounding shoes or be barefoot, then right. those electrons like flowing through everything um will like balance your oxidant, antioxidant system, um, which can really improve outcomes for mama and baby through the labor delivery and immediate postpartum. Wow. Um, okay. So that kind of fits the labor part. And then yeah. if we could just look into pregnancy, we just have in reverse <laughs> pregnancy and sunshine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so like one of the things that's going on right now, um, is that rates of like liver complications in pregnancy are just really ramping up like the, okay. the rates that happening. And it's one of the things that like, if the liver shuts down in pregnancy, that's pretty much like what the provider will say is like, okay, we need to induce and get this baby out. Like if at all possible. Right. Um, the liver is where vitamin D is processed. And so when, you get sunshine and the sunshine vitamin D pathway going and it goes through the liver and it, um, they haven't done this research in pregnant women, unfortunately, but in like, you know, non-pregnant people, um, sunshine directly limits the, they call it non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, something like that. NF. Yeah. Um, and so that is directly related to a person's like sunshine environment the sunshine comes in um so for pregnant women sunshine obviously they need that sunshine for their liver to work um vitamin d in pregnancy is also really interesting like the levels of circulating vitamin d could um could basically kill someone who's not 
pregnant and they still don't understand how or why that happens because like, wow. they'll, you know, they'll do the test and be like, oh, you're vitamin D deficient because they never test the active form. Right. <laughs> they test the storage form. Yep. Uh, but the active form of vitamin D in pregnant women just like through the roof. And they, yeah, like I said, they still don't really understand how or why that's happening. Um, there's obviously a lot of good guesses. Um, so vitamin D is an easy way to talk about sunshine, but it's not the only thing that's important. Yeah. Like another really common thing that happens in pregnancy is high blood pressure. And so high blood pressure is part of the preeclampsia. So if a woman gets high mm-hmm. blood pressure, that's happening, it, then she starts to have swelling and these other complications, protein in her urine. Um, then that's another reason that they'll, they will induce her to, you know, like say like, okay, this pregnancy is over. We need to get the baby out. Um, and sunshine <laughs> causes vasodilation, the increase of, you know, expanding the blood vessels. And so when you go out in the sunshine, the UV light will like open up and dilate the blood vessels. And so um, that is like a really natural remedy for reducing blood pressure. And of course, we all know that it feels good to go out in the sunshine. And then there's like a physical mechanism for like, why does this feel good? Well, because it <laughs> relaxes your blood vessels and lowers blood pressure. Wow. It's true. It just became really warm here where I am in the last couple of days. Yeah. And there's just something so serenity inducing about just like sitting out in the sun it really yeah. does have like a full effect in every capacity. And again, mm-hmm. just for people who are new to this, I do want to reiterate, like, it's not, you don't need to be like lying out in the direct sunlight all day long. You do need some direct sunlight, but even just being outside, whether you're in the shade or opening a window or any kind of contact where your skin and your eyes can interact with the sunlight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And for the women that I'm working with, I usually recommend that they, like, if they're not used to going in the sunshine, if they don't have a lot of um, sunshine, they're going in, um, that there's kind of like a specific way to get started with solar exposure to like be really safe. And um, to me, I even just like to start with the evening because with all of the evening work first, because having a dark night is so like, it's just imperative to being able to tolerate the sunshine. You have to have a good healing thing happening at night. You need to have your melatonin flowing. And so if you can like go outside for an evening walk at sunset after dinner, come back home, turn off all your lights, or they should be off already, use a candle, go to bed when it feels comfortable, and then see what time of day you wake up. And at that point, go outside immediately. Um, But just like starting in the evening, some people will say that makes, um, like I've seen like influencers say like, you know, they're just so focused on the sunrise. Mm -hmm. And for people who haven't been doing that, it's so difficult, like to set an alarm and go out and you're tired. And that just basically gives you jet lag. So I like to start with the evening just based on my own experience. Um, That's a lovely way to with, do it. So start getting your evening light low, getting your nights completely dark, going outside mm-hmm. when you wake up and then gradually getting in sync with the natural light. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. So gradually you'll just naturally start waking up earlier and earlier mm-hmm. to be able to catch the actual sunrise. And that sunrise light is what will prime your body to be able to handle the midday light. Um, the infrared penetrates really deeply. And so like, if it's warm enough, like in the wintertime, it may not be possible, but in the summertime, it might be warm enough at dawn to actually go out and put your pregnant belly in the sunshine. Like as much of your skin as you can possibly get that early morning light, um, is really important for the oxidative stress side, which, you know, this call is like, like I said, we could go, (laughs) we're going all the places. (laughs) (laughs) In so good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so when yeah. th- that's a lovely point. So we're, you're a pregnant mom, you're going outside for, at sunrise or whenever you first wake up, you want to like, ideally be in a place where you can open up and like get that belly. Cause the, mm-hmm. the skin having contact with those, those early morning light frequencies is helpful as well. Yeah. So the, yeah, the morning light frequencies are mostly infrared, um, which is heat, the kind of light you can feel, even though it's not very bright. 
um, which you could also get like this winter. I said it was really cold. And so I was putting my belly um, in front of the wood stove. I would open up the wood stove when it had a nice coal bed of that red coal. Mm -hmm. And that was like when I had morning sickness, as soon as I would put my belly in front of the coals, it would like (laughs) go away for that time. It was the nausea um, would subside while you were in front mm -hmm. of the infrared light. That's yeah, so cool. exactly. Yeah. So infrared is really, really amazing. And um, yeah, so you get that morning light. And so also that's, it's called like photobiomodulation, PBM. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you get, I think at least like 15 minutes of that really like nice infrared light in the morning, it will give you like up to SPF 15 protection um, in your skin for the rest of the day. So oh, um, yeah. you can't make, vitamin D if you're wearing sunscreen, like the sunscreen blocks like 98% of vitamin D production. And you can't even make vitamin D year round, depending on where you live. Like where I live, I just came through the winter. We didn't, Mm -hmm. we weren't making vitamin D from the sun then, but we were still getting the infrared light, which has really good effects, still sets the circadian rhythm, doesn't do vitamin D in the vasodilation and other things. So, um, so, yeah, so, then cool. after so the morning, infrared light yeah. gives us a natural SPF. So yeah, if you are a little bit worried about like, oh, I thought sunlight was really, really bad for me. A whole, that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> the sunlight's yeah. not bad for you. But just know <laughs> that if you're, yes, if you're in sync with the natural light frequencies, your skin will be somewhat protected and, you know, limited mm-hmm. to 20 minutes or whatever in the, at the high noon yeah. time and you'll be okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I do like that, recommending the app D-Minder too, to people who are new um, and, and don't know what it feels like to, you know, like race, go to the edge of sunburn and back. And yeah. um, there's even some controversy about how bad sunburn even is, but yes. um, again, it could be a whole other podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. But yeah, just for, yeah, we, we went, when we, I started getting into this, we went on a family vacation and I told the children, I'm like, when you get that birdie feeling, like go in the shade. Um, yeah. And they all knew what I meant and they yeah. did it and it was fine except when they were swimming mm-hmm. and they'd swim for hours, but because I made them watch sunrise, they actually didn't burn on that trip. So it was so yeah. very interesting. So okay. then, back to, then we get back to your sunset and then yeah. there's more photomodulation and the sunset light. So you, then you're back around to the evening, that infrared. So if you do get a sunburn, if you get that same skin um, under the infrared light of sunset, um, they've actually shown studies where the sunburns heal faster. Wow. Okay. Uh, So it's, you know, you want to have like at least early morning, midday and evening, and you could even put in (laughs) the other like middle of the morning um, sunlight too. And I think that like, if there's any sunlight to skip, it's that like really hot post noon afternoon sunlight that has a lot of UVA in it and so ideally if you go morning mid morning noon like rest and nap would be a really natural like seek shade and then back Mm -hmm. again at sunset that's a lot of time outside and um, I love the um the thousand hours outside concept it's kind of like a homeschooling curriculum I have my Mm -hmm. oldest daughter doing it and um a thousand hours per year works out to about three hours a day which effectively works out to a healing dose of sunshine. Yeah. Um, and so they have a little star sunshine for the kids to fill in. If they make it out before noon, they can fill in their morning sun. Oh, that's great. And then, uh, what was the weather and um, they have ideas for activities and things. And um, they, and that, and so her work came in, like now she mentions a little bit about circadian rhythm, but she just came to it again from these like correlative studies, like children who spend, about three hours a day outside um like have faster learning and physical development and um you know just generally like happier and healthier and brighter than kids who spend um less than that inside so I think that's a really great sink there for any families who are like in the circadian it's just kind of fun to like have a thing to track and like a community to participate in Absolutely. That's super fun. Okay. So a thousand hours outside because yeah, if you're just living a standard life, you kind of, everyone used to talk about the standard American diet, right? We've talked about like the standard light diet. I mean, during the winter, I think 
children are lucky to be outside for 30 minutes a day. Yeah. And yeah, so, absolutely. And so she even yeah. has a plan for like, if you live in an extreme climate, like, you know, you might need yeah. to be getting six hours a day in the summer to compensate for when you can only get like 30 minutes or an hour or like none if there's a blizzard. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's great okay yeah so that's true you could compensate for it and on days where it's easier to be outside all right yeah. okay so I just want to quit skip quickly I think we might have to do a whole other podcast on um well we're gonna have to do one anyway but let's yeah. just skip to the mom and postpartum depression because I know that depression is an epidemic right now among people whether they're postpartum or not um, yeah. so let's talk about that and how the circadian, um, regulation plays into that. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, this is one of those areas where we kind of have to look at data that is not necessarily related to postpartum because they're just, the research is just lacking. Um, and so when we look at other forms of depression, again, like any kind of human studies are really difficult to um, difficult to do for ethical reasons. And so mm -hmm. sometimes I say like, you know, research is lacking and that's a good thing. Like we wouldn't want them yeah. to do the kind of studies that would prove right. or prove this um, knowledge. Right. But like you wouldn't we, want to take a depressed person and deprive them of a good light environment on purpose. That would be. Right. Or take a healthy person and put them in a really crummy light and fire. <laughs> <Get depressed or not. laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So there's, so there's some limited research on circadian mm -hmm. rhythm and depression. Okay. Yeah. So like I've said, they found that circadian disruption is correlated with every form of mental illness. Um, and then we've also seen that, um, from animal studies, so it's, I, I really just like my studies for a number of reasons. Um, one, as, um, as Jack Cruz talks a lot about, like their size difference is so different. Mm -hmm. Like we're really large, they're really small. Yeah. And so that has specific biological consequences. Yeah. Two, they're nocturnal and we're for the most part um, daytime beings. And so that's right. really challenging. Um, and then three, I think like mice are kind of natural enemies of humans. And I think humans just get really sadistic with their mice. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's subconscious or what, but when I read the mice studies, I'm like, oh, oh my God. Yeah. Those poor mice. <laughs> like, yeah. um, which is different than like, like there's a lot of really good like um, research from like cows and ewes and sheep, which are larger animals like mm -hmm. us. They're symbiotic with us and we have a natural like we want them to um, reproduce prolifically and have healthy offspring because we eat them. <laughs> but there's like kind of like a natural, like when I look at those other studies, I'm like, yeah, that, you know, that makes sense um, what they're doing here. But anyways, from my studies, they do tons of studies with mice and depression and easily induce depression in mice by having them in like a dim static light environment. Okay. And that's what happens in the postpartum period is that women basically get stuck indoors um right. they're afraid of burning their babies they can't get away they have a million chores um they might be living on the, you know a high-rise building um with windows that don't open <laughs> you know yep. it's like and then like you know how do you get out to the park like you need at least a month of time to really heal with your baby mm -hmm. um at home mostly in bed so ideally if that's the case that you can't get outside, that you have at least windows that open, that you're getting the natural light in. And a lot of people don't think of it, or maybe it's Alaska in the wintertime or yeah. like all these you know, different things. And then pair that with the nighttime um, inappropriate light use. And then, um, right. So just from the light environment alone. And then okay. we've talked a little bit about this time to eating and, um, I don't do a lot of nutritional counseling. I feel like that's really covered by a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. uh, so mostly I talk about meal timing, but there are a few key nutrients that um, directly impact the circadian rhythm. And one of them, every pregnant woman is going to know, and that's folate. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so folate and the folate cycle um, is the primary donor of methyl groups that drive the epigenetic changes of the circadian rhythm. So I don't expect everyone to like know what that means, but it's basically like, they're like, you, you know, take folate, you know, eat yeah. folate so that you don't have like spinal bifida. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't really go in like, and I understand it's, it's probably pretty boring to most people, but folate um, and that folate cycle is hugely tied in with the circadian rhythm too. So all those things that they're worried about folate, like also are impacting the circadian rhythm. So again, like they don't do these kinds of studies in humans, but an animal study is an extreme folate deprived diet um, will make it so that even if the light environment's good, the circadian rhythm can't have its ups and downs because the folate's giving those methyl groups that drive the, the, the genetic changes. And that was something I didn't know at all. And I find really interesting is that wow. DNA is changing on a day-to-day -day basis. Like I kind of just thought of DNA like, like the yeah. structure that exists in our bodies, and yeah, I didn't really it's kind realize of static. And you're born with a, you're born with a certain type, and that that's it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's actually changing all the time how it's wow. expressing, um, and so that's part of what the light environment is controlling how the genes are expressing. Great. And the changing in those genes is related to um, the folate cycle. So, um, mom having a good diet is important on a lot of reasons. And one of mm -hmm. them is folate doesn't work by itself. So you have mm -hmm. to have all the cofactors as well. And so that's like vitamin D, choline, serine, like a bunch of amino acids um, and all the other B vitamins and um, also like zinc and magnesium. I think that's it. Um, on my website, I wrote a series um, that's just like the folate series that kind of breaks down everything that's going on with folate and the circadian rhythm and oh, how okay. to eat um, in order to support the circadian rhythm through this one particular channel. That's amazing. I'm just going to say the name of your website quickly. It's um, brighter days, darker nights. Mm -hmm. .com. Yeah. Okay. I can remember it's the other way around. So brighter days, darker yeah. .com, Um Nico also ha has a sub stack and a website and she's just like a wealth of information. She writes really interesting and deep in-depth blog articles and protocols. So please do go there if you're pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, so that's one of the other challenges is that, okay. um, that people don't really realize that during breastfeeding, your nutritional needs go up even mm -hmm. higher than they were during pregnancy. During pregnancy. Right. Right. So, so during pregnancy, you're way elevated during um, postpartum and breastfeeding, you're even higher. And a lot of people just kind of feel like, oh, I'm done. Baby is developed. So now I'm off the hook and can go back to my regular diet. And it's really right. important to maintain that pregnancy diet and eating mindset for at least the first six months. Okay. Afterwards. And so that's part of like keeping the circadian rhythm healthy is needing to have that increased um, level of folate. Okay. So you need to have the proper light. You need to have the proper darkness. You need to have the proper nutrition and then they all work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I just want to, um, to wrap up, I want to come back to what we've touched on a couple of times, which is the study that shows the correlation between, um, dysregulated circadian mothers and mental illness in their children later in life, like when they're adults. So I understand that this is, we're talking correlation here, that there hasn't been a proven causative mechanism, but mm -hmm. what is your sort of best guess? If you had to, knowing what you know, having studied what you've studied and looked at all of this research and your understanding of the human um, body from a quantum biologic perspective, what would your guess be as to what is happening with that situation? With a, yeah. a starting with a dysregulated circadian fetus and then having it show up much later, having the effects of that show up later. Okay. Yeah. That's a really, really good, really powerful question. Um, I'm going to get back to you in just a second. I have a question from one of my lovely children here. No problem. <laughs> So, to, she's been pregnant, and I take Daisy since she's been alive. 
Okay, cool. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to ask if you had that. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so in that paper, they were tying it to circadian disruption manifesting as sleep disruption. So um, I first started learning about this specifically with regard to autism and um, through a paper that was actually about fluoride and autism, and it turns out that fluoride blocks melatonin. And so they're finding that mm -hmm. autism rates are higher in areas that have higher levels of water fluoridation. Um, so they were saying like, what's going on here? And they dug in and say, oh, it's blocking the melatonin and autistic children also tend to have sleep problems. And so um, in other papers they found like, being able to um, like reduce the symptoms of autism, the negative symptoms, mm -hmm. um, by teaching parents, um, you know, sleep hygiene. Like it turns out, a lot of these moms were like letting their kids have caffeine and different things that um, I think most people know aren't good, but you know, a lot of people don't know that like chocolate as a dessert um, is going to disrupt sleep. Mm -hmm. um, that blue light, right, um, yeah. will disturb sleep. So the first place that I encountered all of that was like this like autism sleep connection and then finding out that every mental illness has this sleep connection. And so it has to, it seems like it has to do with the body not being able to like build and repair itself properly at night because of having like not enough antioxidant potential and also like the autophagy picture. Yeah. Um, where the body is just not rebuilding itself. And so there's a constant like breakdown. And so then um, there's, there are usually other illnesses that are like concurrent with mental right. illnesses. They don't usually just happen like by themselves. Like in some cases they do, and it might be like an early warning sign. Like I think of depression as kind of like an early warning sign, mm -hmm. whereas like bipolar would be a bit deeper. Um, and then schizophrenia is really deep. Okay. <clears throat> um, so yeah, autism and ADHD and learning troubles and all of that. And if you just kind of think like the brain's not having the time to like myelinate itself properly in early childhood um, and not able to recuperate and like build itself up at night. Um, and yeah, that paper is really interesting. I wrote about it. Their term that they're using is circadian entropy. If you okay. want to find it, I think they're the only people saying circadian entropy. Okay. So if you search search bar circadian entropy mental illness, then you can find that paper, and they go into the things that they think um, are are like at play. Wow! And so just to like really hit on that point, is we didn't specifically say this is that having high quality sleep is like foundational to every single aspect of health. So what you're mm -hmm. saying is like this connection between disrupted sleep, um, which is a symptom of circadian dysregulation is connected to these breakdowns in our, in our minds, being able to function properly, uh, probably over multiple years of not being able to rest and repair mm -hmm. during high quality sleep time. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, like, kind of another example and another angle on this, um, bilirubin, which is, um, like, the, the thing that causes jaundice, like, in adults and in babies, mm -hmm. um, is broken down by blue light. And um, w when they look at people who have, like, there was this study they did, this was on, you know, like, adult men, um, uh, bilirubin is also a really powerful antioxidant, by the way. So that's another really interesting thing about it. Like that me by like melatonin, it's this endogenous thing that's our body dealing with oxidation and oxidative okay. stress. Um, but anyways, they were studying all of these men that had seasonal affective disorder and found they had a blunted bilirubin cycle, indicating that they weren't having, like it's supposed to climb through the night mm -hmm. and then fall Day, right like bilirubin like comes up in the nighttime and is also part of this like antioxidant cycle 
And then the daytime, if you go out in the sunshine, you will break it all down. Okay. But if you keep having blue light late into the night, then your bilirubin will never climb. And so okay. not having this bilirubin cycle, it was highly correlated with having seasonal affective disorder. And so that was oh. just, like, like I said, like we use oh. melatonin to be highly researched, but you could also look at bilirubin, cortisol, like there's so many different markers of the circadian rhythm. Right. And having those, having those dysregulated comes up in all these different ways. Because I mean, when I, before I like went deep into all of this, the only time I ever thought about circadian rhythm was when I was crossing time zones and had to deal with jet lag. And I was like, it was sort of like a temporary inconvenience that was part of travel. And, and I had no idea. And I think most people don't, that the circadian rhythm, you know, just coming back to where we started, is really the foundational cycle mm-hmm. of everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. This, yeah. The right things happening at the right time. And so we're not just like constantly in daytime mode. We're not constantly in nighttime mode. We're not flipping at random between daytime and nighttime mode. Like we have like day correlating with day, like the real physical, like outside daytime in the geographical area that you live. Right. I think that's one of the other common misconceptions is people think circadian rhythm is just like you go to sleep and you wake up at the same time. And like your circadian rhythm is tied to your alarm clock. (laughs) Right. This is one of the, like the other people that are thinking about on a daily basis, I think tend to start in that place. Right. And but it's tied to the sun's the, clock, not our. The jump is the sun's clock. Yeah. So for like a minimum recommendation, like I said, in the research, it says kids probably need like three hours of outdi- outdoors time. Um, there is a, a population study from the UK that um, was tying like morning type versus evening type. And so um, any like on average, people that spend one to two hours outside in the natural sunlight tend to be morning people. Um, yeah. And people who spend less than an hour outside a day tend to be evening types. Right. So it all, it all comes back so that, to the sun. Yeah, the minimum dose. <laughs> <Think about that. laughs> it's like if you're pregnant or wanting to conceive, like at least one hour outside. Um, And if that doesn't do it for your sleep cycle, then you might be a person who needs two hours outside. Wow. Yeah. We just need to figure out how to make that work. Nico, thank you so much. (laughs) This was really, really fun. I learned so much. I know everyone else is going to learn a lot. Um, I really want to take this recording and send it to every pregnancy group (laughs) in the world because it's such important information. So thank you for the important work that you do. And thanks for being here today. Awesome. And thank you so much to Meredith. I really enjoyed the the quantum certification that you went through it. it, Like I knew a lot and it still filled in so many pieces for me. Um, So I also highly recommend everyone. uh, Yeah do take that course or be, or just join the QBC and watch the videos in there too. There's a lot of really good stuff. So, um, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. It's a really fun community and I love it because people like you show up and learn stuff and then turn around and teach us stuff. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's just a really nice positive feedback loop. So yes, yeah. we'd love to see anyone who wants to join us there. Thanks so much, Nico. Okay. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Bye. This has been the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast. To find a practitioner who practices from this point of view, visit our directory at quantumbiologycollective.org. If you are a practitioner, definitely take a look at the Applied Quantum Biology Certification, a six-week study of the science of the new human health paradigm and its practical application with your patients and clients. We also love to feature graduates of the program on this very podcast. Until next time, the QBC.